Thank you. All right. Uh, can you stand up, please? Uh, Jeff, are you here? I want you to videotape this crowd screaming. <laughs> Shalom from Oxford, UK. But there's gladly, only gladly. Uh, there's only one problem. Is that these, these are the only lights here? All the light, all the light of the world, right? Well, here. the good thing is that nobody can tell how old you are. From <laughs> so, uh, all right. So, look, I'm going to count to three, and then you're going to scream. I'm going to go off to the side a little bit. Shalom from Oxford, UK. And then you will go wild and just clap and yay until I tell you to stop. All right? Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. One, two, three. All right. Okay, good. All right, now you can go back to be depressed, oppressed, and suppressed. <laughs> it's good to be here. I love the UK. I love your accent and tea. <laughs> I had tea yesterday, and I get to hear the accent all day, and there's nothing better than this. I've been to the UK a few times. In fact, um, our first public reading of scripture took place uh, while I was in London recording my uh, previous book, audio book, because you've got one of the best studios here. Uh, so this is where I travel to record the audio book. And uh, so, uh, look, uh, I love this uh, country, but the people are really what I love the most. And uh, I couldn't wait for COVID restrictions to be lifted to have you guys almost the first uh, on in nine to be able to. <clears throat> and you, you, you probably say, well, that was horrible. That was dif difficult. We suffered. Nobody cared about us. We were the harshest. We had the harshest sanctions, the harshest restrictions. It was crazy. No, it wasn't. Think about what's going on in other places around the world today. Everything has to be brought to the right perspective in order to understand what really is going on around the world. So what in the world is going on? This is the title of our message. And when things look so bad and the world seems as if it is falling apart, Again, a perspective is all we need, a good one, a healthy one, a biblical one. Over the last two and a half years, I was not disappointed by any government. I was disappointed by Christians. Because I know what governments are all about, but I also know what Christians should be. And so I'm not surprised that they're pushing for globalism. I'm not surprised for their new gospel that is going on. I'm not, I'm not surprised at all. I am surprised at how many Christians lost it and, and then became useless vessel to carry the word now. You know, I'm reminded of the road to Emmaus. When Jesus was on his way, well, the two disciples were on their way to Emmaus. You remember Sunday, it was just after the resurrection of the Lord. The two women already went to the grave. I mean, remember, everything is done. The disciples already know the tomb is empty. And there is no great joy or celebration anywhere. You would think that the resurrection of Jesus should bring some joy, some excitement. Nothing. Just like today. So many Christians are so depressed that they forgot that the Lord has resurrected. That they forgot that we worship a living God. That for him, this is nothing. So we're going to pray and then start this message. And I hope that you understand this is not a message to 
condemn or to rebuke. This is a message that we, we need to hear in order to understand that if we, if we lose it now, what's going to happen next week when things are going to get worse? Or say, Father, I thank you for your word. Your word is true. And that truth we need to be sanctified by. And Father, we ask today that it is not going to be anybody's opinion, but your absolute truth that will ring and sound from this pulpit. We thank you and we bless you in the name of the Holy One of Israel, Yeshua HaMashiach. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. So on that Sunday morning, there were two disciples that were making their way to the village called Emmaus. Were they happy? Is the Lord already resurrected? Absolutely. And the Bible says, behold, two of them were traveling that same day to that village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they, were, they conversed and reasoned, they conversed and reasoned. They tried to make sense of everything they see. How? By taking the word of God out of the equation. And in their human minds, they're trying to make sense of everything. And that leads them to what? Depression, anxiety, being angry, being sad, alienating themselves from the rest. Look, they're leaving Jerusalem. They're leaving the brethren. They're leaving everyone. They're elsewhere. They're going, this is the walk of shame, the walk of guilt, the walk of confusion, the walk of sadness and... And they walked and they talked. They tried to reason. The Bible says Jesus himself. Who? Jesus himself. Now it's not a Jesus that looked different. It's Jesus himself. Jesus himself, take a look, drew near and went with them. When was the last time you went to somebody's uh, funeral and on your flight back home? He was sitting right next to you. <laughs> well, they're walking after they already buried him on that Friday. Remember? And they're walking with the knowledge that, you know, the tomb is empty. But they're angry. They try to, make, to reason all of this. And he's just walking right by them. With them. Not just by them. And the Bible says their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And why do you think their eyes were restrained that they did not know him? Because... He is the word of God. And at this point, they were not into the word of God. Not at all. And and look at this. The Bible says that he said to them, what kind of conversation is that you have with one another as you walk and are what? Sad. The resurrected Lord is walking by two of his disciples. These are not Pharisees. These are not Roman soldiers. These are not Sadducees. These are not Sadducees. <laughs> these are, look, these are two of his disciples. And they're walking away from Jerusalem and they are sad. And Jesus is asking them, why are you so sad? And I can ask the same thing today. Because I believe the Lord is asking so many Christians today, why are you so sad? And take a look at this. The one whose name was Cleophas answered and said to him, now he's getting very Jewish right now. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which uh, happened there in the last, in these days? And Jesus said, What things? (laughs) So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. Look, they're saying all the negative things. And then watch this. You would think that, you know, they'll stop with the death. But we, now comes the thing, 
We were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. They're disappointed of Jesus. They are sad. It's not who we thought, whom we thought he is. We wasted three years on this guy. We could have made millions with fishing and other things. <laughs> we left the boat loaded with fish. What have we done? And death is one thing, but crucifixion? Like the last of the thieves, or like the, the most criminal of all? <sighs> Indeed, beside all of this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. <laughs> you would think that at least now, the smile will come to their faces. They're still angry and sad. And they astonished us when they did not find his body. And they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Uh, these are women. What do they know? <laughs> so, so, certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it. What? Just as the woman had said. I guess they did tell us the truth. But him, they did not see. What did they just testify of? Jesus resurrected. And what was their attitude? They're sad. They're angry. They're sad. And... Jesus is not rebuking the Pharisees now, and he's not rebuking the Sadducees, he's not rebuking the Romans, he's not rebuking it. He's saying to his own disciples, Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to what? Believe. Believe. He didn't say, you don't go to the synagogue, you don't listen to the word, you don't do this. He says, your problem is that you actually are going to the synagogue. You actually are hearing, but you don't believe word. That's your problem. Which word don't you believe? That the prophets have spoken. He basically said, you leave Bible prophecy out, you're going to miss out why I had to come, why I had to die, why I had to resurrect, why I'm going to take you, why I'm going to come back with you, why we're going to reign from here. You're going to miss out everything. Because you're taking that which the prophets have said out because too fantastic, hard to believe, too big, whatever it is. And beginning at Moses. No, he says, ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Where were you when Isaiah wrote his chapter 53? Where were you? When Hosea, when, when I, Jeremiah, where were you when these were read in the synagogue? Messiah had to have suffered all these things and then enter into his glory. You want it just ready to make. Instant, fast. You want him as a king already. No. That's not the plan of God. That's your plan. This is how you see things. Because you and the word of God are not synced. You have your own opinion based on your wishful thinking. That if I am a Christian and if I follow God, nothing bad is going to happen in this world. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets. By the way, was he teaching from the New Testament? <laughs> Neither Paul. Never ever taught from the New Testament even once. You're probably, what are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> You're like, I, I just need to tell you, Jesus is not a Christian. He was never a Christian. How can Christ be the follower of Christ? A Christian is a follower. You understand that? Jesus was not a Christian. Before you throw stones at me, I'll tell you that God is not Jewish also. And he expounded to them in all the scriptures. 
which means at that time, the Old Testament was all the scripture. And it means that throughout the New Testament, when it talks about scripture, it talks about what? Old Testament. So every time the New Testament mentions scripture, it's the Old Testament that it mentions. And he expounded to them in all scripture the things concerning himself. And so we must believe Jesus made, when Jesus makes prophetic promises, we must believe that they're going to happen. We must believe that these things, we shouldn't be caught up with the man-made wishful traditions and sheer ignorance skewed, uh, skewing our understanding of what is to take place. So when Jesus said to his own disciples in Matthew 24, answering their question, he said, take heed that no one deceives you. In other words, deception will be the first thing. Deception. Fake news. False teachers. Sensationalism. It says, take heed that no one will deceive you. Yeah. And then he says, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. How do I know that he's not talking about uh, Israel here, but he's talking to the church? Because the tribulation is Jacob's trouble. <laughs> they better be troubled. This is, see, that you're not troubled. All these things must, say must. must. Not maybe, could be, will be, must come to pass. Yeah. And then he says, but the end is not yet. COVID is not it. That's it. It's not the end of the world. The end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, earthquakes in various places. And all these things are just what? The beginning of sorrows. Man, I, I, I have the gift of encouragement today. Everything Jesus said to his disciples. You see, Jesus never promised them a garden of roses. He never deceived them that everything is going to be so easy from now on. He actually told them the truth. Unlike some prosperity teachers and some life coaches that are calling themselves pastors. He is telling the truth. And he's saying wars and rumors of wars. You can hold hands and sing kumbaya as much as you want. You can do meditation as much as you want. Man's heart is so evil and deceitful that there will be always wars. And we've been in a constant war. I mean, I don't know if you know that. Ever since the end of World War II, there's been less than 14 days of peace in this world. And, and, and take a look at, at, at the transition from 2021 into 2022. And we see... Iran and Russia and North Korea. And China. We see countries that are positioned, either already started wars or positioning themselves towards war. You, you would think that the Iranians will settle with what they have. They have a beautiful country. Why do you need more? You would think that North Korea will just stay where it is or China will have enough of what China has. Oh, no. Oh, no. Not at all. We all witness what's going on right now in the Ukraine. Yeah. And I could care less what's your opinion about the war. Who is to be blamed for? I can tell you that every day I'm watching piles of dead bodies in the streets and, and soldiers. And, and it, it's just heartbreaking. And whether the Ukrainians shut down a helicopter or the Russians shut down a helicopter or whether it's, uh, you know, uh, 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 some uh, uh, unconventional type of weapon that is being used in some places. Listen, people are dying left and right. Russia is positioning himself. Make no mistake, Rush is moving ahead. And when they don't like something, when they feel threatened, boom, they move ahead. 
They don't ask permission from world leaders or no. The North Koreans started flexing their muscles all over again with ballistic missiles, intercontinental missiles. And as of now, they're now about to resume their nuclear tests. If that's not enough. Iran's proxies are becoming ever more dangerous in the region. And we're talking, we're talking about Hezbollah. We're talking about their proxies in, in Syria, in Lebanon, in Gaza. We're talking about their proxies in Iraq, in Yemen. And they're training more and more in other places all over. They watched the U.S. Um, pulling out of Afghanistan, and they became so emboldened that they can actually eliminate the American influence from the rest of the Arabic and the Middle, uh, Arab world of the Middle East. And thankfully, the word of God is not hanging on what the Ayatollahs think. A few years ago, there was a different president in the White House, different prime minister in the Israeli prime minister's office, and by exposing the hypocrisy of the Palestinian issue, they managed to ignite a peace process that has not been such in, in the last 70-something years. And that piece, unlike anything else we've been doing for the last, I don't know, 20-something years, is actually working. We've got ties with Bahrain and the UAE, now with Morocco, even with Sudan at this point, and even as of late, we are actually helping them. There's a war going on in Arabia. You may not hear about it. You may not know about it. But missiles are flying every other day from Yemen towards Saudi Arabia cities. Even missiles flying towards the UAE to Abu Dhabi. The Iranians are determined to not just attack but destroy Israel. And it's not something that, you know, they say whispering or in their own communication system. It's something that they out in the open declaring. They vow to destroy Israel in a future war. They urge destruction of Israel prior to nu nuclear talks. China versus Taiwan. Every other day, if you follow me on Telegram, I report every time the Chinese are violating the airspace of Taiwan with nuclear bombers. BBC will not report that. We'll, but they are there. And of course, the invasion of Russia into the Ukraine, I will spare from you what I just saw last night. It took me a while to fall asleep last night. Because last night, yesterday, I reported that the Russians retreated from the suburbs of Kiev. But what I didn't know is that they left, at least in one city, carnage that I have never seen in my life in the city of Bucha. You can find out yourself. You can see for yourself. I, I'm not even uploading those videos there. It's just crazy. But as you can see, wars and rumors of wars. You don't have to go to a war. You just have to scare the people that is there is going to be a war. A rumor is enough to put down economies. What about pestilences? Everybody were crying about COVID, COVID, COVID. But I want to tell you something. Whether COVID was hard or bad or, I mean, look, nobody loves it. Nobody enjoyed it. But I can tell you something. Take two steps backward and look at the whole picture. In 1889 to 1890, there was the Russian flu. We talk about a million people died. 18, 1918 to 1920, the Spanish flu. We're talking about 50 million people died. 1957 to 58, the Asian flu, the H2N2, we're talking about um, also hundreds of thousands of people. In 1961 until today, the cholera pandemic killed thousands of people. 1968 to 70, the Hong Kong flu that killed um, a million people worldwide and 100,000 in the U.S. alone. 1981 until today, the HIV, the AIDS that killed all more than 
30 million people worldwide. 2003, SARS killed thousands of people. 2012, until now, MERS, the Middle East Respiratory uh, um, uh, System um, uh, uh, Syndrome, excuse me. And, and that was also a COVID one. And it killed also quite a few people. 2009 to 2010, the swine flu. 2014 to 2016, Ebola. Uh, 2015 to 2016 in the other part of the world, the Zika, 2019 to 2022 now, COVID, and it seems like we're at the tail end of it. And if you think that this is the end, okay, God talked about pestilences, thus COVID is the last. No. <laughs> you see, we got it too good. We handle it one at a time. Have you read the book of Revelation? There will be many at the same time. Earthquakes, natural disasters. I report that also. Look. Look how many earthquakes over the last couple months only. Even in Israel and around Israel. Volcanoes are erupting. Even where I'm going to next in Sicily, Etna, but also in other places. In, in Alaska, three volcanoes erupted at the same time. Also in Tonga Islands and other places. Tsunamis. Listen. When you're looking at world events of this world without a biblical lens, it's very easy to fall into fear and anxiety. For the believer, though, this should not describe us. While the world remains in bondage to fear and uncertainty, hope is what should characterize us. Since we know what must, not will be, must take place according to the Bible, not only do we not need to be scared, but we need to use this as a tool, as Peter says, to give a reason for the hope that is in us. 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the, word, the, the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and with fear. God graciously allowed us to know the end from the beginning. Do you understand we are the only people on planet earth? Providing that you believe in the word of God. We're the only people that know the end from the beginning. The Lord says in Isaiah 46, remember the former things of old. I am God, there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. What? Declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, what? Things that are not yet done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. And you've got to understand that as much as it's a terrible thing to see what's going on in the Ukraine and what's going on in other parts of the world, such uh, in Afghanistan and others, Bible prophecy has nothing to say about the nations as such in their relations to one another. That's why you don't hear about World War I or World War II or maybe even about the coming World War III. It's not in the Bible. What's in the Bible is only their relation to Israel. The people... In the land. Deuteronomy 32, 8 and 9 says, When the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam and he set the boundaries of the peoples, I guess borders after all are biblical, he says, according to the number, he set those boundaries according to the number of the children of Israel. For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the place of his inheritance. The key to all prophecy is the Jew. If the Jewish nation had not forsaken God and neglected the Sabbaths in the Old Testament, there would have been no times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles, mostly described in the book of Daniel, began when God transferred earthly rule from king of, the kings of Israel to the Gentile king Nebuchadnezzar. And they will continue until 
Israel again becomes the head of all nations. And if you know Bible prophecy, it is going to happen. So when you want to understand what in the world is going on, what nation should you be focusing on? You got that one right. Botswana. No, I'm, jo I'm joking. <laughs> Israel. And in our own lifetime, we've seen an, an amazing transition from Psalm 83 to Ezekiel 38. From the birth of Israel in 1948, when all those nations in Psalm 83 are mentioned, and they're there to what? Attack Israel. Why? So the name of Israel will be remembered no more. Because Israel just declared its new name. No more Palestine. Yeah, you see, the Palestinian was the original name. No, it wasn't. Get, first of all, get the facts lined up. Who gave the name Palestine to the land? It's the Roman Caesar Adrian. It has nothing to do with Arabs or Muslims. And he named it in order to mock and ridicule the Jews. So he named it after the Philistines. It has nothing to do with Arabs. Okay, now to the other fact that you don't know. Before Israel was born in 1948, it's the Jews that called themselves Palestinians, not the Arabs. The Arabs called themselves Arabs. Why? Because where are they from? Uh, there you are, Arabia. They're from Arab nations. And they were proud of it. And the Jews called themselves what? Palestinians. Why? Because the name is still called Palestine. So the Palestine Post is the Jerusalem Post of today. The Palestine, Palestine Philharmonic is the Israeli Philharmonic today. The Palestinian Brigade was a Jewish brigade in the British Army in World War II. Make no mistake. Even Golda Meir had a Palestinian uh, laissez passer a passport. That's how we describe ourselves. But we knew it's, an, it's a temporary name because David Bergoyan is about to step up on a, on a higher elevated area because otherwise you wouldn't see him. And he was about to declare a new name, an old name, a biblical name, a God-given name. And when the American president was ready to uh, uh, acknowledge this amazingly newly born state, he didn't even know what the name of the state is. So he wrote, I hereby recognize the state of the Jews. <laughs> then he heard, I don't know if it's on the BBC radio, but he heard that David Ben-Gurion declared it to be the state of Israel. So on the paper of the U.S. presidential recognition, he crossed the state of the Jews and he put the state of Israel. That's how much we were not even sure what the name of our own country is going to be. Because we've been called Palestinians because we were in that area that the world called Palestine. So much so that even in half of your Bibles, in the, lap, in the part of the maps, it says Palestine in the time of Christ. How can it be Palestine in the time of Christ? When the Adrian gave that name in 135 AD. Hello? So in Psalm 83, all the neighboring countries, Jordan, Lebanon, uh, Syria, Egypt, all of them, assisted by Iraq, invaded into Israel in order to cut us off from being a nation that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. That's why he said, do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace and do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies, it's not the enemies of Israel. They're not the enemies of Israel. They don't even know, they don't even understand that they're not fighting against Israel. They're fighting against the God of Israel. And again, do not be still, O God. Behold, your enemies make a tumult. Those who hate you have lifted up their head. And they've taken crafty counsel against your people. Who are his people? And those who, have, who, who hate you, and then they say, and then and consulted together against your sheltered ones. Who are his sheltered ones? And the Bible says, they've said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation. That the name of? There you go. 
will be remembered no more. They, those enemies of God, they cannot fight God. So what do they do? They fight the people of God. Let's cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. And where are they from? <laughs> These are all the tents of Edom and Ishmaelites, Moab, Hagarites, Gebal, Ammon, Amalek, Philistia, and even Assyria also joined them. This is all the first tier of countries around us. Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, and of course from within and from even Iraq. They, of course, they wanted to destroy us. But those days are over. Yeah. Those days are over. Ladies and gentlemen, now the Arab countries are flocking to come and have peace with Israel. And today we are at the verge of a, a new era where in Ezekiel 38, Israel is strong and safe and prosperous. And now the new war, the coming war, has nothing to do with let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. It is not political. It is not even a, so to speak, religious the Bible says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tuval, and prophesy, what? Against him. Hello? God is not on the side of anyone that is going to do something to Israel. Look, prophesy against him and say, thus says the Lord God, behold, I am what? Against you. O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tuval, I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army. Turn you around, again, lead you out with all your army, horses, horsemen, all splendidly clothed, greatly accompanied with buckles and shields, all them. He says, Persia, Persia is Iran. The Ethiopia, by the way, here, it's, the Hebrew is not Ethiopia. The Hebrew is Kush, which is Sudan of today, and Libya. Are with them and all of them with the shield and helmet. Gomer in the house of Togarma. This is Turkey of today. The many people are with you. And the Bible says that they're not coming to Israel in order to cut us off from being a nation. They're coming to steal, to plunder, to take booty. The Bible says it's a financial war. Israel from barely surviving. From being a nation uh, or people that were about to be completely... Gone became a regional superpower when it comes to military, when it comes to technology, when it comes to energy. But then, last year, we have a government of change. We're the only country in the entire Middle East, listen to this, the only country in the entire Middle East that not only did not outlaw the Muslim Brotherhood, but actually its government is leaning on the votes of the Muslim Brotherhood. That's what we have. And I'm torn as a Messianic Jew, as a Jewish believer, because I, I see what's going on in the world. And so should all of you. The, the line is drawn, and, and we see the great separation already happening. You are growing more and more alien and, 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 and completely, uh, I guess, stranger from, from what you see in, in, in your world around you, don't you? It's like, I don't even know your, my country anymore. You don't even know your country anymore. You don't, know even, you don't even know how the, the young people think nowadays anymore. You see that there is a growing separation of Christians from non-Christians worldwide. And as the world is flocking towards this new gospel and to that globalism and to that all of this thing, we are separating ourselves because we know this is not for us. Now, we're, we're, we don't do that by means of demonstrating against governments and, and all of that. That's not who we are because half of the world is demonstrating against its governments. Spiritually, we see that we are not on the same page anymore. And when we throw the spiritual element out and we start fighting fights that are not ours, then we start denying Christ. And unfortunately, 
The world is going to embrace the Antichrist because the world is getting conditioned. And when the time for us to leave is coming, you're going to be taken out of the way, the Bible says. And that's when the, the world is ready. Or, that's it. The Antichrist will have ready-to-go world. But unfortunately, and I'm, I'm saying that with tears in my eyes, my nation is also separating itself, but separating itself from much of its heritage and much of, and by the way, God knew that and wants to be liked by the rest of the world. Why do you think they're going to fall for the Antichrist? It's because they will be convinced that there is something good about this guy, that there is going to be peace, that there is going to be a temple. In the name of a third temple, we will take whoever gives it to us. That's it. Government of change. And in America, look what Hegel says. What experience and history teach us in this, that people and governments never have learned anything from history or acted on principles uh, uh, deduced from it. And, if, and look what it says, Eric Snow says about the life circles or cycles of empires. He said, the growth of wealth and comfort clearly can undermine the values of character, such as self-sacrifice and discipline that led to a given empire's creation. Then the empire, so affected by moral decline, grows weaker and more vulnerable to the destruction by forces arising inside or outside of it. Not surprisingly, God in the Bible super, uh, specifically warned the ancient Israelites against departing from worshiping him once they became materially satisfied after entering the promised land. He understood this human tendency. We see increasing sexual immorality, undermining the family structure, uncontrollable immigra illegal immigration, reckless living, people put on their credit card 50 times more than they can afford. Who cares? Actually, people don't go to work because if you go to work, why should I go to work? You work, you pay for me. That's how it works nowadays. And lack of personal responsibility. And that leads to someone whose campaign is build back better. <laughs> Isn't America a better place right now? No. no. It's the quickest way to destroy a country. How to destroy a country within a year and a half. And you see everything I talked about all around. As, as Romans chapter 1, Pastor Mike just read earlier, is clearly being shown all over. You see how everything is happening in America, but not only in America. It's happening also in the UK. Let's face it. Let's face it, America, UK is the first place this type of garbage lands on its way to Europe. Or the first place it lands on the way to America from Europe. You guys are the, they dump on you everything. <laughs> Protesting. Climate change. What's the reason for the, the fallen state of this planet? What's the reason? Sin. <laughs> Until you address that problem... You can do whatever you want with any type of car you want. The glaciers will melt. God made us having seasons of cold and warm. Cold and warm. That's how it is. It's amazing how stupid we can get. The fear behind climate change is nothing but more than... Uh, Man-made hysteria. If we're sticking to the claims made over the last several years, let's face it, the earth would have fallen apart years ago. In 2008, at that time, former Vice President Al Gore came to Washington 
and, and deliver another speech warning of the climate crisis. The leading experts predict that we have less than 10 years to make dramatic changes. That was in 2008. Less than 10 years, this whole thing is gone. Four years ago, we should have been under the ocean. I can go on and on and on, but I want to tell you, Genesis 8 says, While the earth remains seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. That's it. I want to tell you, folks, so what in the world is going on? We are in the middle of a fierce spiritual battle. That's what's going on. And Ephesians 6 says, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in where? Yes. Heavenly places. There are some levels in the heavenlies where there's a lot of wickedness. Satan did not move homes yet. Remember the great war that is going to be in heaven, according to Revelation, and he's going to be cast down. Remember? And that's when the Antichrist is going to rise. This is it. It's the great exchange. He comes down, we go up. <laughs> Second Corinthians 4. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe... Lest what? Lest the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. And I want to end up this bit with, with how then should we live in these last days. It's so important. First of all, fear not. Fear not. While the world is so scared, they're looking at you, at us. And if we are scared as well, where is your faith then? Why would I believe in what he believes and he tells me to believe in order not be afraid when he's so afraid? <laughs> Fear not. For God did not give us the what? Spirit of? Fear. But what? Power, love, and sound mind. Power, love. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power. And of what? Love. You know how many Christians in the last two and a half years were more violent, not physically, but online, than the non-Christians? I am the biggest target, trust me. Every day. And they do that because they don't even have sound mind. There's no love there. There's definitely no power there. And there is no sound mind there. That's why they're so afraid. Because they're so afraid they inject fear in everybody's. We must make sure that we are avoiding moral hypocrisy. We should not be associating things with, for example, the mark of the beast. That we, that we have around us uh, for years. This is simply... The direction of the world. The world has a direction. The spirit of the Antichrist is here. So the world is not becoming greater and more heavenly and more godly. Yes, we all know that. But not everything that happens. Oh, it's a mark of the beast. Because once the mark of the beast will come, guess what? We're out of here. We're not even here. And when it comes, it is going to be the mark of the beast. There is going to be a beast. Give you an example. How things are taken out of context. In 2018, a Swedish company started implanting chips under the skin. The same nation with the same company put all the data in the chip of COVID later on. So everybody is quoting this as the mark of the beast. They just forgot to tell you that the same country and the same company already did it in 2018. Had nothing to do with COVID. So you come to someone 
Hey, it's the mark of the beast. Look what they're doing. This is in. And he, he, the guy is just two minutes on, on internet. And he said, Why, What are you talking about? They've been doing that for a few years already. Nothing to do with COVID. And you are standing right in front of him, looking not that smart. Do you really think that this spritz or vaccine is, is how they're going to track you with? Hello? Your phone is tracking you for the last few years? <laughs> Honey, I think I'm interested in buying a Volvo. The next hour, Volvo will come up on your feed. Are you kidding me? They know what you eat. They know what you drink. They know what car you like. They know what type of movies you like. They know everything. You are walking with a tracking device every day. You not only walk with it, you feed it. What do you want to eat? I want Thai today. Oh, she wants Thai today. She loves Thai food. You tell them. You're walking with, with computers and your cell phone. And you're worried that they will track you. Look, your credit card is tracking you. Everything in your house is tracking you. We must be biblically based. We must first be taken out of here in order for God to complete his work on this earth. Our job is to occupy until he comes. We don't live under the illusion that this world will turn to God and then will usher in his return. No. This is the uh, theology called kingdom now theology. We are going to make this world a place for him to return to. No, we are not. He is going to make a place there for us to go up there. It is so bad here that he prepared a place for us there. The Bible never said, Jesus said, in my father's house there are many mansions. However, let's not talk about it. You prepare a place for me. And when I come, you will receive me unto yourself. So where you are, I will also be. That's not in my Bible. The Lord said to my lords, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Hebrews 1, but to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? You understand? God has to take care of business here when we're gone in order for Jesus to come back and rule in this world. You understand that? Yeah. What we need to be is battle ready. We need to have the whole armor of God, the Bible says. Not a few things, not some things, all of it. God is not sending us to the battle without all the armor that he wants us. That you may be able to stand against the vials of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, as we already uh, saw that. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded yourself, what? Your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having uh, uh, shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of what? Peace. The gospel is the gospel of peace. You've got peace with God. No more, there's no more animosity. You and God are, God is with us now, not against us. Okay? So you don't go out and shout for a war. This is not our gospel. Our gospel is the gospel of peace. Now let your military fight the war. Yes. <laughs> By all means, that's their job. But we have the gospel of peace, the Bible says. And it says that we have the helmet of salvation. The gospel of the shield of faith. Helmet of salvation. Sword of the spirit. And we must be watchful with all perseverance. And I could go on and on with all the verses. That you can just move them. The waste of truth. You can see uh, how it says 
um, in First Chronicles, the breastplate of righteousness. You've got verses upon verses upon verses. Gospel of peace. You see shield of faith. It's all over there. Sword of the Spirit. But I want you to remember one thing. Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the, wor in the world you will have what? Tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome this world. And I want you to remember, things will not get better. Not at all. I could lie to you now. And my nose would, you know. <laughs> I, I have one issue to deal with. It's my back. That's why I'm wearing some back support right now. But I don't need to support a nose. Uh, I, I need you to understand, folks. Listen to me. It's not going to get better. What we've seen is just the introduction. Things are going to get worse because... This world is not our place. And it is being conditioned to look and get ready more and more to the one who is going to rule it. We are here for a reason and for a season. And I need you to know that until he comes, instead of being cessationalist and fighting fights that are not for us. You know what the problem with so many Christians over the last two and a half years? The gospel was the fifth or the sixth battle they were fighting. They fought everything else first. Whereas for us, number one, the gospel. Because you know what? Whether you like vaccine or not, eventually you'll go to hell if you don't know Jesus. <laughs> okay, without COVID vaccine, you'll be in hell. So what? What? There's no area for non-vaccinated people in the lake of fire. <laughs> they don't get better treatment. <laughs> we have to be using our common sense. It's the battle for the gospel that we need to take part of. That's the weapon we need to wear. That's the armor we need to be girded with. And that's the occupation of all of us. Occupy until he comes. And that's the only thing I'm asking you in these last days. And the only way for you to be able to do that is if you are going back to the road to Emmaus. If you listen to the word of God and believe in it. These are two different things. And trust the words that the prophets have said. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank, you, we thank you for your promises. We understand that this world is going nuts. But we also understand that we have such a glorious, beautiful promise of your soon return to take us out of here. We have a wonderful promise of a great place that you have prepared for us. We have an amazing promise that you are not giving us any spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. Father, help us to understand that in these last days, the only battle for us is the battle for the gospel. And the only thing we need to be active about is promoting righteousness. Righteousness in our society, righteousness in our family, righteousness in our own soul and mind and spirit. We thank you and we bless you. And we ask all of this in the matchless name of the Holy One of Israel, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lamb of God who will come back as the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Prince of Peace, Emmanuel. His name is Yeshua because he is our salvation. And it is in his name and for his glory that we pray and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Amen.